Okay. All right. I'm recording. Just so you know, we've had a few people who've requested that we record. Um, okay. Thanks for everybody for uh, joining me. Let me start by asking, um, and I think you can raise your hand on that end, or I can see, or just speak up. Have any of you ever done a listing appointment? You have, nev you have never gone out and done a full listing appointment for anybody? I haven't. You haven't, Michelle? Anybody else? Okay, that's fine. I just want to, uh, I, that's, that's good. So Michelle, I know we're, we're starting to do. Has anybody gone out, but they're just not comfortable doing it? They leave, I'm sure someone else is gonna get this listing. <laughs> When you when you like, anybody anybody have an experience of going out and just not being comfortable with the process or not quite sure what you're doing? Okay, well let me then ask you this: those of you who have done a listing presentation, tell me if you have. Do you have problem areas, or what would be helpful for you to know? Uh, what when we're talking about? I've done very few that I didn't know either the people or somebody they knew. So okay. I've done very few that was a complete stranger. Okay, this is Sherry saying that. Yes. Um, and so when you go in and you know the people, does that, that make it easier or is it harder if you know the people? Uh, it's a little bit of both. Yeah. A little bit of both. Yeah, it can be. Um, and that's one of the things we're gonna talk about uh, this evening. I'm gonna talk about just preparing for the listing presentation and then I'm going to show you my listing presentation. Um, but the thing I would to have everybody muted because we have a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, if I could have, I'm gonna, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna mute all of you. I'm gonna mute you, but if you um, have something to say, if you would just unmute yourself and then feel free, or there is a thing you can raise your hand if you feel like you wanna uh, uh, say something. And what I'll do is I will stop if I have a question and unmute you guys so you can talk. We've got a good number of people on here. Okay, so let me first start uh, by thanking you. I appreciate you all being here. I'm gonna break tonight's class down into three things. Number one, preparing for a listing. Number two, the actual listing presentation. And then number uh, three, pro uh, presenting an estimate of proceeds. And then uh, we will, um, uh, answer. I'll answer all your questions. So let me first bring up, um, hold on just a second. I'm going to bring up the uh, PowerPoint here just a second. I'm certain there is a much easier way to do what I'm doing, but I will figure this out. Okay, let me bring this up here. Okay, can you all see this, the screen? You should have the listing appointment on here. Can you guys see yes. it? Yes. Okay, we good. Can. All right, so the first thing I wanna to talk to you about is just who is this that we're going to see? Sherry just talked about everyone that she had gone to a listing appointment on was either a friend or a past client or someone that she had some familiarity with. I call these listing appointments hot listing appointments because what they mean is that unless you just totally screw up, uh, you're, you're gonna get it. Um, the attitude is that the listing is mine, that the paperwork is just a formality. The next group would be people that you have some limited contact with. 
That would be a referral from a past client, maybe a friend of a friend, someone in your farm network, um, a response to advertising. In other words, um, you have a foot in the door, but you still need to impress. It's not an automatic listing. And then I have what's called cold listing appointments. This is if they call off your sign, they respond to advertising. Maybe it's because of name rec recognition, but you don't know them. They don't have any connection to you except for recognition of your brand. And many times that's a competitive listing appointment. They will call you and they will say, I'm interviewing three agents. You're one of them. Come over here. That's our attitude tends to be on that one. I need to go all out if I'm going to get this listing. In other words, you really work at it because you feel like you've got to impress this person to, to get it. So my first lesson for you is that who the homeowner is doesn't change your job description. You have to get in the habit of treating every listing appointment as if you're competing with a top agent for that listing. You don't take a listing or homeowner for granted and every potential listing deserves a presentation. And in fact, I often tell people that when, if you are going to meet with your mother or your college roommate or someone with whom you have a very close relationship, they need a listing presentation even more because the truth is they would rather hire me to list your house, but they're hiring you because of that relationship or because they feel they're obligated to. So you really have to go in and prove to them that, that even though you have this close relationship or friendship, that you are a good hire, that you're a really good realtor. So the, one of the things I tell you is when you're making your first contact with that homeowner, try to be in front of your laptop. Don't be talking on your phone in the car, even though you want to very promptly get back with someone who makes that contact, you want to have done a little bit of homework if at all possible. So the first thing you're going to do once you know who they are, you want to get the address of the home. And the first thing I always do is pull up that home in the MLS. If you didn't sell it to them, you want to find out what the home looks like, what condition it was in when they bought it. And, and really importantly, did they have it listed by someone else last year or pretty recently? What you don't want to do is have them have to fill you in on that information. You should already know when you pick up the phone. I'm often on the phone with people while I'm clicking through their house um, because it helps me as I'm listening to them to get an idea of what improvements they've done. It makes me sound knowledgeable because I'll say to them, okay, that sunroom in the back looks like it has screens, you're saying you put windows in it. Yeah, we put windows in it. So again, as much as possible, I like to be in front of a computer when I'm making that first contact. You're also going to look at the interior photos and you're going to look at the price. Now we have been in a market so far for many years where homes didn't ever not sell. I mean, they sold as soon as they went on the market, but occasionally you will come across homes that were listed in the past couple years. They're still owned by the same individual, but for one reason or another, they didn't sell or they decided to take it off the market. Again, you want to know that. So you want to be the one to ask them, can you tell me why your home was on the market in 2017? Or can you tell me what happened while it was listed in 2018? You want to already have that knowledge uh, before um, you make that contact. All right, so when you are on the phone with them, let me tell you the, a rookie mistake that agents make. They want the consumer to feel like they have great experience and they're really good at this. So they don't ask any questions because they feel like if I ask questions, then it makes me sound like I don't know what I'm doing. The, on the contrary, before you hang up, you, this really is starting your listing appointment right on this phone call. You want to take the time to ask them. Mr. and Mrs. Smith, since you've owned your home, what improvements have you done? What is the age of the mechanicals in the roof and the window and the interior? 
uh, what is your lot like? Or is there any defects to the lot? Now, sometimes they will not even know a defect because obviously they bought the house. So I'll ask them, when you're looking out your back window, what do you see? Well, we just see another house. Or, well, there are railroad tracks back there, but we never hear them. Um, or, or I'll say, do you sit under power lines? Anything that might be a consideration of price. And then I ask them, what is their mortgage payoff? How many mortgages do you have on your home? A lot of newer agents are forget feel like that's a personal question. They don't want to ask it. It is a personal question, but it's your business. And if they don't want to answer it, they'll tell you that. I'll occasionally have a client say, you know what? I really don't want to disclose that. And I'll say, that's fine. Um, but, but most of the time they'll tell you, well, it's in the range of, or we think it's around 190 or, or whatever. And then if the property was listed before, we want to know what the feedback was. What did you hear uh, from when it was list when that property was listed before? So this first conversation is very important. First of all, the questions you're asking speak to pricing of a home. It tells, the, tells me what they've done to the home, what improvements. It also tells me you're gonna begin hearing their opinion of their home. Is it nicer? Does it need work? They're gonna say things. Well, no, the carpet's still the same. We always intended to change it, and I guess we could, but we really don't want to. You're going to begin hearing just sort of their attitude of selling. Um, this is also the time to ask them, why are you selling? Uh, what is your time frame? Um, and, and that sort of thing. So don't be afraid to let that first contact be a 10 minute phone call. Because by asking those questions, you're telling the homeowner that in fact, you know what your job is, you know what you're doing, and you wanna make sure you have all the facts before you go meet with them. So any questions about that? All right, let's go on. Before we meet the homeowner, now this is very important, especially if you're a newer agent. You want to drive their neighborhood to see the exterior condition and the location of their home. Um, let me tell you why this is important. Because you can tell a lot about the home by looking at the outside. You can tell a lot about the neighborhood by driving through. And especially, I always say this in the fall and winter, when it gets dark at five or six o'clock, if your appointment's in the evening, you are driving up in the dark. If you haven't seen that home already in the daytime, you really don't know what the neighborhood is like or what the condition is like. Number two, you're gonna drive the neighborhood with comparable sales in hand to visual, visually identify the active homes, the pending and the most recent sold homes. Let me tell you again why this is important. When you drive the neighborhood and you have that CMA in your hand, you can look at the houses, you can see where they're located in, rela in rel uh, relation to your client's home. You can, you can get a sense of the feel of the neighborhood. And here's where it really pays off. When you're sitting with that homeowner and they, they start looking at the homes that you're comparing to them, here's what's gonna happen. It happens every time. They have listened politely to you during your presentation, but when you start talking about money and houses, they're gonna lean forward, put their glasses on, and start looking at the houses. You wanna be able to say, oh yeah, this is the one. Um, they're gonna say, well, where is Kingston Court? And you don't wanna say, I don't know. So you're gonna say, you know what? It's down here, you take the first left, and there's a little court back in. Oh yeah, now I remember that. What did, the, what did that five minute drive do for you? It, show, it makes you sound like an expert in the neighborhood. Or you say, you know what? This home sold for a little less, but that's the one with the big tower in the backyard. How do you know that? Are you an expert on the neighborhood? No, you showed up 15 minutes early and drove around the neighborhood. So again, before meeting with them, you wanna drive the neighborhood, look at the exterior condition, drive their neighborhood with comparable sales in hand to identify the homes. And you're also going to find out what non MLS activity is going on around the neighborhood. Is there any new construction or roads closed? Are there any for sale by owners or foreclosures around there? Is a road being widened, which is going to restrict access to their neighborhood? If you know that ahead of time, you can look into it. So when they say to you, Kathy, is this gonna be a big problem that right now we, they can't even get into the front of our neighborhood? I can say, well, you know, they can get around it. And from what I've learned, that's gonna be over in about six months. 
So again, makes you sound like a neighborhood expert when all you did was do a little bit of homework. All right, good listing presentation has three components to it. Most agents, and I'm talking the top agents in the city, believe that a listing appointment has one component and that is coming down, coming in, throwing some numbers at the homeowner and saying, what do you wanna price your home at? I'm telling you that you will be better than the top agents in the city if you learn and practice the three components of a good listing presentation. Number one, you're going to evaluate the home with the homeowner. Now remember, you've already started this on the phone. So by the time you get to their house, they're already somewhat familiar with you and you're somewhat familiar with them in their house. Number two, you're gonna do your marketing presentation. And number three, you're gonna do an estimate of proceeds on the sale of their home. So let's break each of those down. Number one, recognize that when choosing a realtor, sellers are making a high stakes decision. More than just signing a contract with you, they are buying into a relationship with someone who's going to help them with one of the biggest undertakings of their lives. A good listing presentation is the ability to build trust in a short amount of time. I'm gonna read that again, it's very important. A good listing presentation is the ability to build trust in a short amount of time. You want to leave the kitchen table with the seller thinking, I believe this realtor understands our needs and I trust this person to represent me and my interest better than I could do so myself. Let me backtrack again to what I was saying before. In your, when you're early in your career, many of your clients are gonna be friends and family members or warm contacts, meaning someone you know referred them to you. <coughs> you want to be able to leave that presentation with them saying, you know what, Michelle is, I know she's your college roommate, but boy, I'm impressed. Or I, I know you, you know, I'm talking to Tracy because she's my cousin, but boy, I'm really impressed. You want to prove yourself as a realtor, not just that you're not just at the kitchen table because you're on their Christmas card list. So again, you want to leave them with the understanding. And the only way you can do that is by being a professional, starting with arriving on time, even being early. I like to come a little bit early. I sit in front of the house, I review my numbers, I review my presentation, and I ring the doorbell right at the time I'm supposed to be there. Um, another tip that I give you, I don't ever do my comparable sales more than 24 hours in advance. I want to have just looked at them before I come in and meet. And if for any reason I have a busy week and I'm doing them ahead, I will always stop, review the comparable sales, drive the neighborhood before I walk in the house and kind of refresh my mind on them. When you enter the home, you remove your shoes. Even if they tell you it's okay, you still take your shoes off. You identify the meeting place and ask the homeowner if you can put your paperwork there. I know this, I'm being very, very basic, being very practical, but I'm, I'm telling you there are reasons for all of this. You want to take, even though you're in their home, you want to immediately take charge of the two hours that you're going to be there. You want to immediately take charge of that meeting. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna walk in, you're gonna identify the kitchen table or whatever's there. You're gonna walk in and you're gonna say, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, do you mind if I put my stuff here? And then what I'd like to do is have you give me a tour of your home. What have you done? You have taken uh, control of the meeting. You have um, dictated where you're going to end up after walking around and you have given them direction on what you're going to do next. So you're not all just sitting there staring at each other. So then when you say, to ask them to give you a tour of the home, this time is very important. And the reason is, is because you're gonna listen. You're gonna make mental notes on the homeowner's opinion of the condition of their home and needed improvements. I'm telling you, you will learn more, you will learn more in 15 minutes of listening to them walk through your home than you will the rest of your relationship with them. Here's what you're gonna learn. Number one, relationally, you're gonna learn who's in charge. If it's a husband and wife, 
You're going to learn who is more uh, motivated to do things, who's not motivated to do things. You're going to you're, you're going to identify who the decision maker is. You're going to dis, dis, uh, determine who's in charge of the move. Um, if, he, if they're both walking through and the husband's quiet and the wife is saying, "Okay, we are going to be clearing this out and." Um, Habitat for Humanity is coming to pick this up and I've arranged for goodwill over here and don't worry about this mess over here. We're already going to have it cleared out. You know that's the decision maker. Um, and again, it can be either, but you're, you're going to listen to that. You're also going to hear their opinion of your, their home. If you walk in and it looks like a bomb, a bomb went off and they do not apologize, that you got a problem. If they live like that and they're not apologizing for what it looks like, and I don't mean just end of the day clutter, I mean it looks like they haven't cleaned in three months, then there's some education to be done. On the other hand, many of your homeowners will begin apologizing the minute you step in the door because of pictures crooked. You love those homeowners because what it tells you is that they have pride of ownership and they are ready to jump through any hoop to make their home look good. So you're going to walk through, you're going to make mental notes. Many times they'll do your work for you. And this is where HGTV has been great for us. They will walk in and say, yep, we know this needs to be cleared off. We're going to paint this wall. We know we need to do that. You're, and that's great. You know that they're already motivated and on their way to, um, to doing what they need to do. So any questions about that? All right, next, understand. Kathy, I have a question. Yes. Uh -huh. So I I just uh, visited a seller today, and uh, their home is exactly what you described. is just uh, just a lot of cleaning. It needs a lot of de decluttering, a lot of cleaning, and I'm I'm writing up um, a um, a recommendation to them what to do in each room and how. Um, and how to clutter and what stays in the room, what doesn't stay in the room. And is this the way to do it or is there an easier way? Because, and, and, uh, and I'm not sure if they envision what I'm trying to tell them. Well, let me, let me say then, that's a very good question. What I do is bring my laptop to the meeting, go online and show them what homes look like that are on the market. And, and many times by seeing other homes, and I just flat out tell them, you know, I know you're busy, I know you've got kids, but this is what your home has to look like. Do you feel like you're capable of doing that? And, and just see what they say. Another thing that is an investment, just as we invest in um, photography, is to invest in a stager uh, to go over there and walk through the house with them. If you, if you don't feel like you want to be the bad guy, then have a stager go over there, walk through and give them um, a list to do it. But I find when you show them what homes look like online and you walk through the home with them and say, okay, remember I showed you that home where nothing was in the room except a couch and a lamp. That's what this room needs to look like. And you get them thinking about what they're going to have to do um, to clear that, to clear the room. That way you're not telling them that their house is a mess. You're showing them a product on the market, which is another home and saying, in order to sell this product, your home needs to look like the other product that's on the shelf. And this is what it looks like. Some people are able to do it, some are not, but you do yourself and your clients a disservice if you don't bring it up to them. Yeah, can uh, I'm I'm thinking about sending them actually the uh, photos or of the old um, listing when they bought the home. Is that yeah. offending or not? No, if it looks good, you could say, "Look, remember when you bought the home? It looked like this. Why'd you buy it? Because it looks so attractive. You need to make the home look like this again." Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so more than money, you're going to start by listening to them. Again, you sit them at the table. One thing to recognize is that this may be the only time in the entire transaction until you get to closing that you have both parties at the table, if there's two of them. Many times after the listing appointment, you're dealing with one or the other and signing things electronically, and you really don't see them again until uh, you're sitting at closing. So you want to start by just icebreakers. Why are you selling? How do you feel about it? Have you had experience selling homes? 
<coughs> excuse me, what is your past experience? Do you, what experience do you have dealing with realtors? Um, so, and why are you doing that? Again, every, every question I ask has a reason and it's usually not the answer to the question. Um, the answer to the question obviously is important, but what I'm trying to find out listening to them is how do you feel about it? Are both parties on board? Um, is one party ready to go? The other party is not sure they wanna sell, that sort of thing. Um, and the other thing is, is it really allows me from the beginning to kind of listen and hear what kinds of things I need to um, point out and be on top of in this appointment. For example, when I say what is past, what past experience do you have with dealing with realtors, I'm not looking for dirt on my colleagues. I'm looking for their attitude towards the real estate profession. And, and sometimes they've had a great experience. Other times they've had a bad experience. If they've had a bad experience, I want to know why. I want to know what did, what was a bad experience so that I can make sure my experience with them is not the same. I, I listed a home last year where one of the homeowners told me they didn't like their previous realtor because this realtor would not get on the phone with them. All this realtor would do was text. And they said, we would ask her to call me and she would text. And they said, we're all, all about texting, we do it, but when we wanna talk, we wanna talk, okay? When I hear that, that is registered. I know in my head, make a note, dealing with this, these people, they are phone people, not text people. So again, that's the reason you ask these questions is, is moving forward, you are putting a game plan together in your mind as to how you're going to deal with these people. What are the factors that influence a homeowner's decision on what realtor they're going to hire? I, again, this is not scientific. This is anecdotal. This is my experience based on having listed hundreds of homes over the years. My gut sense is this is what it is. Number one, they're going to look at product and service. What do you have to offer to sell the home? What is your marketing? What is your experience? What is your track record? They are ultimately selfish as they should be because their consumers paying a whole lot of money. They want to know what are you going to do for me? That is, that is the, the, a, a big draw. 20% is trust. Do I trust you to make decisions on my behalf? Do I have confidence in you? Have you sold me on your ability to do the job? And from a very practical standpoint, do I trust you in my house? We have access to people's homes unlike any profession at all. Even plumbers and roofers and electricians, the homeowner is right over their shoulder. We are in there by ourselves, free to go through their closets and their drawers and their cabinets if we wish to. They have to be able to trust us that we're in their home, in their finances, in their decision making, and can we trust you to help us make those decisions on, my, on their behalf? Can they trust you quite frankly, to make decisions for them. You will get to the point in your career, if you haven't already, that homeowners look at you and just say, what should we do? And, and you're making very high stakes decisions for them. So do they trust you? Chemistry, being someone's realtor is very much like a short-term marriage. I can or I can't let them intimately into my life for the next several months. Sometimes they're just not going to like you. That's the bottom line. It, there isn't a click there. They don't, they prefer another realtor they talk to. Nothing you can do about that. And also this last one, I call it political. This is if there is some connection. My brother-in-law has a license. We may have to use him. My boss suggested his realtor. I hate to say I didn't choose him. Um, <clears throat> so when I hear that, someone gets on the phone with me and they say, they say, Kathy, we really wanna hire you and we want you to come over, but my sister-in-law just got her license. Okay, right there, I say, look, I, I love you, I'd love to list your house, but if you're not gonna be able to have Christmas dinner together this December, I, I'm not coming out. So do you feel realistically, if you want me as your realtor, that it is okay within the relationships in your family that you do not hire your sister-in-law then I will come over. But if you feel like even after meeting with me, you are still gonna hire your sister-in-law, I respect it, but I'd rather wait and let your sister-in-law have a shot 
and then I'll step in or I'll send your sister-in-law a referral but I'm a busy realtor and if there's no shot that I'm going to be working with you I respectfully decline to come do that and they'll be honest with you sometimes they'll say yeah you're right we're gonna have to hire her or they'll say you know what no we've already talked about it and this is important we need to sell our home we'll just explain it to her but don't be afraid to nicely and even with humor ask that question or you're going to be spending a lot of time at dining room tables and not getting the job so if you hear any inkling in their conversation with you that there is a realtor in their atmosphere that they may be obligated to hire, I would stop and ask the question before I took the time to uh, go to go out there. Um, listing appointments are fun when you're new at them. When you, when you get to the point that you're doing them five and six times a week and you're missing kids' ball games to do them, you're gonna become very careful about what you go out for and what you don't because you're not going to spend two hours at someone's dining room table when you know that you will not be hired uh, for the job. All right, any questions there before we move on? Okay. All right, next. The actual listing appointment. This is what you're going to cover in the listing appointment. You're gonna sell yourself in your brokerage. You're gonna set expectations. You're gonna set a realistic price. You're gonna show the cost of selling a home and you're gonna seal the commitment. Now, in a moment, I'm gonna do my whole listing presentation, which takes less than 25 minutes, and I do all of these things. But I'm gonna break it down for you as to why we do it and what we do. Number one, what do I have to offer? You're gonna sell yourself and the brokerage, number one. What that means is what is your experience? What is your philosophy of business? What's your market share? Do you have awards? Do you have designations? This is your time to brag, but I always say it's a very short time to brag. You don't want to bore them because they don't care. They really don't. They're listening politely. They're waiting for you to get to what's important, which is what will my house sell for and how are you going to do it? But it is important for you to put in front of them who you are, your experience, your market share. And let me just say, if you're new in the business and you don't have a lot of experience and you don't have a huge market share and you haven't won awards, then you go back on the brokerage. Keller Williams is, uh, Greater Columbus is huge. They have a philosophy of business. They have a huge market share. They have won awards. They do have designations. So that's when you lean on your brokerage. And, and, and I'm, when I was new at this, I was never afraid to say I was new. I'd say, well, you know, I don't have that much experience, but I'm working for a great brokerage. I have mentors. I have people to, uh, you know, to lean on when I have it. And there are times that I would even bring an agent with me from the brokerage if I felt like I needed that uh, added support. So don't be afraid to do that. Uh, don't, don't skip this part of the appointment just because you feel like you don't have anything to sell. And the reason that this is important is because even though the homeowner acts like, or, you know, they're going to be listened to you, but even though they feel like this isn't important, when there's a bump in the road on the listing, and there always is, they're going to go back into their mind and say, now, why did we hire her now? Why? Oh, oh I remember. They're going to want to lean back in on what was your experience? Why were they sold on you? What did you bring to the table? So this little bit is very important. The next thing is, what can you expect from me? This is where you set expectations. Virtually every problem between a homeowner and a realtor can be traced back to wrong expectations. So what can they expect from you in the market, in your marketing, in the number of showings, access to you, and what is their responsibility? You know, um, when you have a, a few listings, li every listing is like having a different employer. And if you don't set expectations, they're going to set ex expectations on you. And so when that's okay if you have one listing because you have one set of expectations. But if you have 10 listings, you're going to start disappointing homeowners 
because you're going to forget what their expectation was. And unfortunately, you, you let them set the expectation instead of you setting the expectation. So when you set the expectation, it, you always remember what it is because you said it. It's what you do. So what you need to do going into the listing appointment is to set expectations on the market, the marketing, the number of showings, the access to you, and what is their responsibility. Mr. and Mrs. Smith, we came into March in a very, very strong market, but we're now in the midst of COVID-19. Um, it's unpredictable. Every day is changing, but based on my experience, we're still going to have showings. The marketing, I'm going to show you what I'm going to do here. Based on showings in this price point, according to showing time, your, this price point's getting about 11 showings a week. That's what I would anticipate. Um, and then access to you. Can they call you at midnight? Can they text you at seven in the morning? That this is your time to set expectation. Mr. and Mrs. Smith, I'm very prompt getting back with you, but if you text or call after eight o'clock at night, if it's not an emergency, I'm sure you'll understand, I'll call you the next day. Or Mr. and Mrs. Smith, I'm available seven days a week. I do go to church on Sunday morning, so between nine and one, I'm really not available but I'll call you as soon as I'm out on Sunday afternoon. So access to you. What time frames are you available? When are you not available? And how can they access you? Mr. and Mrs. Smith, how do you prefer to be communicated with? Do you phone? Do you text? Do you prefer email? You're going to have some homeowners who do not want to hear from you. Just shoot me an email. Shoot me a text. You're going to have other homeowners like one I ran into in that listing that said, you know what, I do text, but I would prefer a phone call. That's where you set expectations. And then what is their responsibility? Mr. and Mrs. Smith, my expectation is that you're going to not turn down showings unless it's absolutely impossible that you'll uh, um, have the house clean and presentable, that lights will be left on. Uh, and that um, you'll, you will vacate the home for every appointment. Are we in agreement that you're going to do that? So again, you want to set expectations. You want to let the homeowner know what you do and what you don't do um, when you list homes. Um, you list a home, and the first Sunday, Sunday morning, you get a call at 7 in the morning, and someone says to you, Sabrina, I don't see our home in the Columbus Dispatch. And you are waking up and saying, oh my gosh, did I tell her that I would put it in the Columbus Dispatch? No, I didn't. Why does she think that? Well, because the neighbor said her realtor put stuff in the Columbus Dispatch. So what is the problem there? The problem is wrong expectations. That only happens if you don't set those expectations in a listing appointment. Mr. and Mrs. Smith, I want you to know that I don't uh, do any print advertising because we find that it's not effective, but let me show you how I expose your home on the internet, which is where buyers are finding homes. If you do that on, the, uh, on, on your listing appointment on Sunday morning, your client is not going to be looking in the Columbus Dispatch because you already told your client their home will not be there. So again, these are the kinds of ways you avoid issues with your, with your clients because you have set expectations here. What is your home worth? I'm gonna go over this very quickly because this is not a pricing class, but we're going to talk about setting a realistic price. We wanna know what did the homeowner pay for it? What did comparable home sell for? What is this home competing with? And again, a great seller's market doesn't change what the mechanics of a CMA are. Even though we are in a great seller's market, it doesn't change. We are still going to be looking at what did the most recent home sell for. I then present what's called an estimate of proceeds for my client in which I break down. By the way, I print this before I see the house. So I always do a three price range and I do a low, middle and high and then with a minute I step foot in their house, I already know if they're gonna be on the low end, the average end or the high end, based on how nice their home is. If, if there is a wide range of pricing, which is very common in very expensive homes, I will do two or three of these. And then once I see the home, I'll pull out the one that's most appropriate. 
So again, you want to do your homework ahead of time and come prepared to break down what the fees are in selling a home. If you don't know what any of these fees are, you want to sit down with your title agent and have them explain it to you because your seller is going to ask you, what is a conveyance fee? What is a delivery fee? What is a deed prep fee? You want to be able to explain every itemized fee on here because your seller very likely will ask what that is. So again, run three different price points, ask the homeowner for a payoff, make sure you have all mortgages. Some clients have a second mortgage on their home. Make sure you can explain all charges on the seller's net. Any questions there? All right, have I learned your trust? I call this seal the commitment. When you go to the home for this appointment, you want to have listing paperwork with you. And let me back up and say, usually what I do, because I, I don't want to be dishonest and say I do this every time. When I go out to a listing, I will ask them, I'll say, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, can, uh, let me help you. Um, make sure I'm prepared for whatever you're going to do on Monday night. Do you want me to come prepared to list the home with paperwork in a lockbox? Or do you want me to come give you information with the intent that we're going to meet again to do that? And then I listen. If they say, no, we're not making a decision, we're two months away from selling, I'm not gonna bring the paperwork with me. Kills a lot of trees and it wastes a lot of time. But if they are the least bit, eh, we might, we're not sure, I have the paperwork with me. Once I have completed my listing presentation, I'm gathering my things, I'm getting ready to go out the door, I do two things. Uh, if, if they are not listing their home that night, I do what I call give the homeowner permission to ask for more. And what I mean by that is, this is particularly important if they're, if they're interviewing you and a couple other agents. I give them permission after meeting with the other agents to come back and ask me for something that another agent offered. I say to them, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, I feel like what I've offered is in terms of selling your home uh, will we'll be very successful, we will sell your home, I think it'll be a smooth process, but let me leave your home by telling you this, I want to work for you. You have a beautiful home, I would love to have the privilege of representing you. So I know you're meeting with other agents, if either or both of them offer something that I have not offered to you, but you would prefer to list with me, please call me and let me have the opportunity to agree to do that as well before you hire one of them. Because I wanna work for you and I want that opportunity. And then I ask them for permission to call them because I'm not gonna sit around and wait for them. So when do you expect to make this decision? Well, we think we'll know by the end of the weekend. Okay, well, with your permission, I'll call Monday morning. Why do I say that? Because when they're sitting over that dining room table trying to decide between three realtors, I want them to know that I'm calling them the next morning. And if that has any weight at all, then, well, gosh, we probably should hire her because she's me calling us in the morning. So again, I want to be proactive and say, okay, that appreciate that. Uh, if, you, if you don't mind, let me call you Monday morning. So again, you walk out the door. If they have signed paperwork, you want to review the process and the timeline with them. Thank you, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. I appreciate it. Let me go over again what we're going to do. There is a lockbox on your door. We use professional photography, so I'll have an email out to you telling you when the photographer's coming. If you offer staging, the stager will be calling you to set up staging on your home. Um, based on our conversation tonight, we're having pictures taken today. Uh, probably not a good idea to have you on the market over Easter weekend. We'll have you on the, uh, on the market Monday morning. Is that what we've agreed on? Yes, it is. What have you just done? You've set expectations. You've made sure that everybody's on the same page for what you're doing. Thank them and then leave. Then what I do is I go home and send them an email thanking them and reviewing everything I said to them. Why? Because I forget. I don't remember, did I put the lockbox on or not? What did I do? But I, re I recount our meeting and then I s copy myself and send them a copy and that goes in their file. So if I forget, I just put, read my own email and remember what I, what I did. Okay, negotiating your commission. Regents always ask this, so I'm gonna go ahead and address it. First of all, recognize that there is a reason listing agents are the top 
gross commission income agents in the city. Virtually always, your top listing agents are your top money makers. Why? Because they're making money on that listing when it's just sitting there. The least amount of money you'll ever make on a listing is when it sells. In fact, this market, which is a hyper sellers market, is not a great market for listing agents. Why? Because our product doesn't stay on the shelves. We make more money when our product stays on the shelves than when it sells. So when it's selling this quickly, we're not picking up buyers on it, we're not able to hold it open, we're not getting calls on our uh, web, web calls on it. So uh, actually a slower market is a more profitable market for listing agents. So if you start out understanding that the least amount of money you'll make on a listing is when it sells, then this helps you to understand. First of all, um, first of all, my answer is you don't ever volunteer to lower your commission. You don't ever make it your idea. But if you are asked, here are things to consider. Number one, is it absolutely necessary to get a listing you want? I have been in competitive listing um, appointments where the homeowner just flat out says, look, I've had two agents in here. We really like you. You've shown us your value. <coughs> but um, the, this agent's offering 4% and this agent's offered to go for five. At that point, do I want the listing? Is it a listing that will sell? I can make a decision then. Do I, do I uh, lower that commission? some things to think about. It doesn't have to be a percentage point. You can say, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, I appreciate that. And while I see a great value in what I do, I do understand it's a difficult decision for you. I'll take $1,000 off my, um, my, my listing commission. So again, do, do you feel in your gut and before that homeowner that you will lose the listing if you don't do that? That's a business decision. Are you representing the client on the purchase of another home? One of the most common reasons to negotiate commission. And again, I, I, I do it, so I'm not saying don't do it, but I'm saying don't volunteer it. Don't go in and say without them even asking and volunteer to do that. Can you make money off this listing through open houses, ads, neighbors, things like that? There are times when just your sign in the yard is your money maker. Some of the highest uh, volume, I mean, dollar making listings are on busy streets. Are you going to get uh, calls off the sign? I just got a call today from the head of a homeowners association that remembered my sign in the yard in a neighborhood and he said they've got a neighbor who's looking for a realtor and he'll have him call me. Again, this is a year later, but my sign was in the yard. So can you make money off the listing through open houses, ads, or neighbors? Well, then you consider it. Is this homeowner a good referral source? I often tell the story of when I was brand new in the business. I lived in Gahanna. I couldn't find Hilliard on a map, but back then I had a, a woman I went to church with call me and she said, Kathy, my brother's going through a divorce and he needs to sell his home. Um, I know you're, you're new and I hate to ask you to do this, but I promise you if you help him on the commission, I, I will tell my family. Little did I know that it was a Catholic family of 11 children. I could have built uh, five homes on what I've made off that family over the last 20 years. Because again, she was a great referral source uh, within that family. So is this person a good referral source? If so, then consider um, uh, negotiating the commission. Um, negotiating um, your commission is a no if it will keep you from meeting marketing expectations and commitments, if you cannot do what you committed to do on the amount of money you are uh, selling that home for, then the answer is no, you can't do it. Um, is it a difficult home to sell? You know, I, I can say this because anyone that's been in the business for 20 years remembers this, um, <clears throat> but there was a is a realtor, I think he's still in the business, named Dave Barlow who back in the boot, what we thought was the boom years from 2000 to 2005, used to run these ads that said, I'll sell your home uh, for 1%. And he, he would have these people, he said, if, if your home didn't sell, I'm Dave Barlow and I can sell your home. So what did he end up with? He ended up with all the homes that wouldn't sell and he had already committed to doing it at 1%. 
and he had committed to running their homes in magazines. So now he had to put 50 homes on one page and they were the size of a penny, the pictures were, and he, and, and he ended up being a victim of his own success. Why? Because he could not uh, meet marketing expectations uh, with, and with the uh, amount of money he was charging. Now, any of you know Dave Barlow? He's, he's a great agent. I'm not criticizing him. I admire him that he had the guts to do the advertising that he did, but he became a victim of his own success because he didn't charge enough for his services. So is it a difficult home to sell? You know, there is. there are times when I go to a listing presentation and I look around and I say, I'm, my first thought walking in the home is I'm going to talk myself right out of this listing because I don't want it. It's a difficult home to sell. So I'm certainly not going to reduce my commission for it. Um, you know, so again, is it a difficult home to sell? No. And then finally, is it a difficult homeowner? If you're the third agent and you, and I always go back and see who the previous agents are and if they're good agents and they couldn't sell it, well, I'm, I'm darn well not going to reduce my commission if he's a difficult homeowner. So again, you're in this job to make a living. You're good at it. You, it's a business. You need to price it like a business. Um, I think Jill's online here. Jill C uh, Campbell, we have just spent a week negotiating with one of uh, her homeowners. And one of the sticking points was, is that we would not reduce our commission at, to the degree he wanted us to. And, and you know, I got on the, got, I took, took it over. <coughs> I guess Jill got tired of him. And I just stopped responding whenever he would say, well, if the Cairo group would take such and such, we could make this deal get done. And I would move right past the conversation. And finally, to get the home sold, I went to Jill and I said, how much is it worth to you to get rid of this guy? <laughs> and so we gave him a little bit because I just was, we could, we won't deal with him anymore. And, you know, it was worth it to get him off our plate. Is that right, Jill? I mean, we, we finally, we finally said, okay, but we didn't, we didn't give nearly as much as he wanted. And, be, but again, I'm not going, I finally said to him, I'll call him John. I said, John, I, I finally said to him, John, you know what? I said, um, uh, I, I'm sorry, but the fact that your home did not appraise for what you think it's worth, is not my problem. <laughs> it's not my problem. I got your home sold, you know, and the fact that such and such happened, that's not the buyer's problem. So you're trying to make everybody's problem, that your problem, everybody's problem. So I, we, so, but I'm saying there's times when you just, it's a business, you deal with it like a business, but there's times when it's just worth throwing in money to, you know, get rid of a homeowner. I never said that, by the way. Okay, listing appointment, uh, fatal mistakes of listing agents. Let me tell you the top mistakes that listing agents make. Number one, they believe that every listing they have to have. Having no listings is better than a listing that won't sell, a listing that generates no income, and a homeowner who's mad. If any of you have ever had a homeowner mad at you or thinking that you can't do your job and is telling you that, you know that it's better off just never to have taken that listing. So. Don't be afraid to be honest about the price, the condition, the decorating, and the updating needed. You need to know what you do and why you do it, and you need to know what you don't do and why you don't do it. If you don't do open houses, then you need to know why you don't do it. If you, if you um, uh, market and, um, and are on, uh, on realtor.com and Zillow and, and you use professional photography, you need to explain to them why you do that. That's what I do and why I do it. And then finally, letting the homeowner steer the pricing and marketing strategy. You are going to be worn out, beat up, and broke if you do not learn from the beginning to, let, to steer the pricing and marketing strategy. That doesn't mean you don't give the homeowner leeway, but you do not give them the steering wheel. Because if you do, you're going to end up on the wrong end of the leash, and this, it is not fun. Before you leave the listing appointment, you're going to get all the mortgage payoff information. You're going to get back title. If you don't know what that is, that is the title policy on their home that's in their closing paperwork. I like to get the survey of the property if they have it in there. You're going to make sure they understand timing, process, and showing instructions. And you're going to make sure the key works in the front door. 
I mean, and that sounds so basic, but there are many, many times, A, the homeowner has no key to their front door, or if they do, it's on a bunch of rings and they hand you one. Don't always check to make sure that the key works and that it's not sticky, that you're not gonna have realtors having difficulty. You wanna make sure that key works. All right, any questions about that? Hey, Kathy, it's Leo Renegado. I did have a Hi. question. Yep. How are you? Thank this has been very helpful, thank you. Um, on regards to paperwork, there's kind of two questions here. Have you ever done um, an in-person signing on dot loop in lieu of printing out paperwork um, and preparing that beforehand? And given what's going on with COVID, I thought I saw on the Facebook group that you did a listing appointment virtually. Yeah. Yes. How's that, how has that changed some of this process, if at all? Um, let me address the paperwork first of all. Um, I, I was in this business 18 years without dot loop, and then what would that be? Five, six years with dot loop, however long we've had dot loop. I love dot loop. Um, but what I find with uh, dot loop is that the explanation of the documents is generally limited to what you write or their review. So if I'm going to be sitting with them anyway to do a listing, a presentation, and they are signing that night, I just bring the paperwork with me. Right. And now what uh, many times what I will do is I will email ahead any of the documents that require filling out like the residential property disclosure form. We have a form that says what stays with the home and what goes. Uh, the form that talks about their mortgage payoff. I will email all that ahead because I don't want to sit there while they're filling it out. So right. usually, ideally, I show up at their house and all of that is filled out and everything else I'm just handing them and giving them a short explanation and they're signing um, the, the paperwork. Then when right. I get home, I PDF the whole thing to them. So they have um, uh, er everything. So that's the paperwork question. Younger, younger sellers, no question. They prefer I just send them the documents and then I get on the phone or on Zoom with them to explain, answer any questions they have. Yep. Now, uh, we're so new into this listing with the, the Zoom, I've only done it twice and it's been very successful both times. Um, that both uh, done the listing presentation that I'm about to share with you. I've answered their questions. I've even, one, things I, one of the things I actually love about doing listing presentations by Zoom is I can actually um, come right down here and bring up the, uh, the well, I'm not gonna do it. I, I can bring up the C, uh, MLS and I can actually do a CMA right in front of them while they're watching on the screen. And they'll point at the screen and tell me where their house is and what they're doing. So that's actually a benefit with Zoom that you don't always have when you're sitting at their um, table. Um, I would say the big drawback is I can't walk through their house. Right. I mean, uh, the, the two times I've done it, uh, one, um, the people uh, sent me pictures of their house beforehand. And then the other one, they tried to FaceTime me through it, but it was not real helpful. I wasn't able. So the, the big drawback, and also you can't smell their house. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot about listing a house that you just have to be there. But I'll tell you, um, it, it is 80% it is there. So it is certainly a reason to keep offering that. Uh, first of all, get, get, uh, get fluent with Zoom. I'm not, but get fluent with Zoom so that you're not nervous, you understand the technology, and you can do it. But secondly, um, look at it as a two-step process. Tell your homeowners, look, while we have to do it virtually, let's just go over 80% of it, and then let me call you in two weeks, and I'll come walk through your house. So it is absolutely not an excuse to stop business. It is to, it, we do it differently, but you can still keep it moving along. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Any, any other questions? All right. I'm going to go through now uh, my listing presentation. And, um, and then I will show you exactly what I do when I talk to homeowners. Give me two seconds here to pull it up.
All right. First of all, my listing presentation is one that I made just using, um, hold on, let me back up, get to the top of it. Um, my listing presentation is one I made using Key. I have an Apple computer. You can do uh, PowerPoint if you have um, whatever. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be super professional. Now, there are people who will make your PowerPoint for you and it will look nice. Um, my team will tell you that for the first 22 years in the business, I had a ratty paper flip chart that was my PowerPoint uh, that was that I did for homeowners. And it, it honestly did, I don't think it mattered. I don't think anyone ever didn't hire me because I didn't have a pretty PowerPoint. So don't let, don't let anything intimidate you. If you get can do a basic PowerPoint, you're, you're, what you're doing is selling them on information is what you're doing. So as you're watching my presentation, I'm going to pre pretend that each of you are homeowners. You're my homeowners. Um, as you're watching this, keep in mind what I said in my first part of my class, which is each of the components I talked about in my um, my uh, presentation are in this listing presentation. But the entire presentation, unless the homeowners are talkers, the entire presentation takes less than 20 minutes in most cases um, that we're doing. So I start out by uh, Mr. You know, Mr. and Mrs. Homeowner, thank you for the opportunity to be in your home. I know you're talking with other realtors and because there are 8,000 of us out there, I'd like to make sure that you understand how we are different, um, what I bring to the table as opposed to others and I like the opportunity to let you uh, answer questions. Then I talk about my team. Uh, I'm the head of the Kathy Cairo Group. What I like to say about our team is that we're client focused. Uh, the reason uh, we're, I'm sitting here in person with you today is because I wanna hear from you want to hear what's important to you. I want to know what's important in the sale of your home. My team has over 150 years of experience. I like the team approach. Mr. and Mrs. Homeowner, let me explain to you what that means. The team approach means that each person on our team is free to do what they're best at. I like listing houses. That's the reason I'm here. I have members of my team that work with buyers, and we have an office staff that is very good at what they do, which is keeping the transaction online. If you've worked with a team before, one thing I want to tell you that I am not, I don't have a team as a buffer between you and me meaning I don't have a team so that I can leave your table tonight and then walk away and you'll never hear from me again. You're always dealing with assistance or someone who doesn't know you. I have a team so that I can focus on you and I can be the one who responds to emails. I can answer your phone calls. I'm the one sitting at your table to negotiate contracts. Meanwhile, my team is working behind the scenes to make sure um, everything goes smoothly. Another great thing about having a team is we have broad geographic knowledge. My team members live throughout the city and we often lean on each other for information on various parts of the city. And then my particular, my particular expertise is in pricing. And, I, and my team members know that when we're putting a home on the market, in addition to your effort and what it looks like, we've got to price that home right. So we all work on that together. Our results are the team sold 190 homes in 2019. Two statistics I wanna point out to you. First is we have a 99.2 list to sell ratio. What that means is almost 100% of what we list sells. But probably the more important number to you is the next one, which is a 96.3 list price to sell price ratio. That means that the homes we list sell for 96% <laughs> of what they list, uh, they sell for 96% of what they listed for. And let me even explain that more, um, more accurately. In this market, that is actually a low number. 96% is a low uh, list to sell price ratio because a lot of homes in the price, price range under 400 are selling for 100% or more. One of the reasons ours is lower is because we do list high-end homes, and uh, some high-end homes, and those homes are not selling for 100% of list price. So our number is a little bit lower than the um, average, but it also tells you we have a wide range of pricing expertise. Um, we have excellent reviews. If you Google the Kathy Cairo Group, we have a, over 100 uh, Google verified reviews. We have a 
uh, rating with our clients. And we not only encourage you to read those, we're th thrilled when you do, because we love what our clients say about us. And we are in the top 1% volume sales uh, with the Columbus Board of Realtors. Okay, that's my brag page, okay? Then I tell them a little bit about me, licensed in 1996, over 5,000 homes sold, master trainer for the Columbus Board of Realtors, expert in pricing, marketing, educating clients, team leader, and again, the founder and CEO of Downsize Columbus. So again, you're done. At that point, you've told them about you, you've shown your credentials, who you are, now you move on. Uh, why a team? Uh, your team lead concentrates on you and your home. We have a back office staff. We're thrilled with Shirley. Everyone on our team is licensed. Uh, I call Shirley our air traffic controller because she sits in the back and makes sure everything goes smoothly. Uh, Brandon is our customer care uh, person and what Brandon does is he makes sure that every T is crossed, every I is dotted, every document that comes through is complete. If not, Brandon comes back and talks to us. Why is that important? Because while they're checking those things, I'm working for you. I'm not having to worry about the paperwork or the back office or are we missing a document here or there. I'm able to be with you and make sure that your needs are taken care of while they're dealing with clerical things. Our, our goal is that we provide um, uh, as, uh, excellent service in the marketing, the paperwork, closing, and a drama-free process in the sale. Now, let me stop right there. Why am I selling a team? Because I have a team. If you don't have a team, then you need to sell why it's better that you're an individual agent. That can be sold just as strongly. The reason I don't have a team is because I want to personally make sure everything is done 110% for you. I don't want you to be talking to an assistant or someone that doesn't know you. I wanna make sure that, that your needs are covered. So again, don't feel like because I don't have a team, I don't have this asset. You sell whatever you have. Then I educate the homeowner on what they should be looking for in a realtor. Number one, they should be looking for knowledge of the marketplace. What's happening in today's market? Wow, that's really important right now because our market is literally changing day to day. So what that means is you don't want a part-time realtor. You want a realtor who's in the market day and night. You want a seven day a week realtor. You want a realtor who understands the market. You want a realtor who has pricing skills. An underpriced home leaves money on the table. An overpriced home won't sell. You want a, a realtor who has negotiating skills. You know, a lot of people ask me, uh, what are you? What what is the realtor's commission? Why are why am I paying you? If you are just paying me to put a sign in the yard and get you in the MLS, then you are way overpaying me. What you're paying me for is the ability to negotiate for your behalf on your behalf. Beyond price, what are the uh, other terms in the contract that can benefit you? You're hiring me because of my knowledge of the contract, my knowledge of the market, my knowledge of other agents, and their knowledge of me. And you're saying, I'm paying you to negotiate for me better than I could negotiate for yourself. Uh, and that is my commitment to do so. My ability to problem solve. Uh, marketing skills, what source will your buyer find to you to, uh, your buyer find uh, used to find a home? And then staging skills. What is the expectation of a buyer in your home's price range? And so that you should be looking for those things. What can you expect from me? Remember we talked about expectations. You're, well, I'm going to provide knowledgeable guidance in the pricing, presenting, and marketing of your home. I'm going to communicate with you throughout the marketing and closing process. And it's my job to get the maximum sale price for your home in the least amount of time with a minimum of inconvenience. And then my team's philosophy, if it's not true, we don't say it. If it's not fair, we don't do it. If it's not right, we walk away. So we, uh, what I've done is I've set the stage of what they can expect from me and what they should be looking for in hiring a realtor. What are tools are buyers using to find your home? Now, let me tell you agents, I screenshotted this right off of the National Association of Realtors websites. So this is not a hard thing to do. It's not a hard thing to build. So the first thing I tell my homeowners is to make them recognize that virtually all advertising anymore is online ad advertising. A lot of people think that only millennials are the prime users of online, but what they forget is that the internet has been out here 
for going on 35 years. So the first internet users are now in their 60s. So what this shows you is that 99% of millennials are using online, but look at that, 89% of older boomers and either even 77% of the silent generation, which is the people who fought in World War II. They are all online. So um, what it tells you is that, the, that you're selling to your client that online is now the way uh, that buyers are buying homes. And I usually pick up my phone and I show them, your buyer is going to find your home right here. So we have to be right here when we're selling your home. Um, I use this graph, again, straight from the, Columbia, from the National Association of Realtors website. What, whoops, sorry. What are the tools real, uh, buyers are using? Everything in the red is what buyers are no longer using. So when your buyer says to you, am I going to be in the newspaper, you're able to say to them, 73% of buyers are not there. Only 6% of buyers say they look in the newspaper. And I frankly think that's a high number. I think that's only for older uh, buyers. So, and down here, remember the little open house magazine used to pick up at Kroger's? Right here, 3%. In fact, that book has gotten down to six pages now. I don't know why they print it. But anyway, you're able to visually show your client that th most of the old tools don't work anymore. Down here, now, again, when I say you build your, you build your um, listing presentation, build it according to your business. I don't like to do open houses personally. My team does them. But I, I only do open houses in a house if I can make money doing open houses. So if I'm going into a $200,000 home in Westerville, then I'm doing an open house. If I'm doing an $800,000 home in Olin, up in Olentangy Schools, probably not. Those are not profitable open houses. So what I do is I tell the homeowner down here that open houses are effective if strategically scheduled while the listing is new. According to the National Association of Realtors, open houses are statistically non-existent measured against the consumer who's a serious home buyer. So what they're saying is, unless you're using it as we do in this market, which is you do an open house three days when it's a brand new listing, you try holding that home open in three months and statistics tell you it's statistically insignificant, the number of homes that sell. So if you don't wanna do an open house, there are statistics to back you. If you want to do open house, there are statistics and timing to back that as well. That's a business decision that you're gonna make. I then tell the, a homeowner, this is why it's important. Your home's first impression will be on a phone or tablet. Pictures not only speak louder than words, words are ignored if the pictures don't grab the viewer. So I show them and very plainly that we start with the MLS. Everything in the MLS is downloaded onto uh, sites and on apps, and that's how the consumer finds their home. So the next thing, I all of our listings on the Kathy Cairo Group are, prof are um, we provide staging and we provide photography. You don't have to. We just started providing staging this year. We've done professional photography now for two or three years. It's the best hundred dollars you'll spend on your listing. So. I first tell them that we offer to you a two hour courtesy professional staging consultation. These are before and after pictures provided by our stagers. And I show them the importance of having somebody come in, give them simple tools to, um, uh, to do staging in their home. And I tell them if they need more home, our stagers offer additional services. We provide just the initial two hour staging appointment. Then I show them uh, the difference in marketing pictures. We have homes that were on the market for 160 days with another realtor. What happens with professional photography? Sold in 31 days. Um, right here, this one on the market for 94 days. Sold in 11 days using a stager and professional photographer. Homeowners love this, by the way. On the market, 112 days. Sold in 19 days once we had professional photography put in. Right here on the market, 101, sold in nine days, just because we brought in drones and used a professional photographer. 
So again, and I'm not saying there was there was price reduction in in, in in probably all these houses, but the key determiner in getting people in was that the, the photography looked good. So I'm showing my homeowner that because I recognize that your homeowner is going to find this home digitally, I'm going to make sure it looks as good as it possibly can. And because the reason I put all that money and time into it is because how whatever your home looks at looks like on the MLS is how it's going to look everywhere. And I show them all the various sites it's going to be on. And then we need to make it look good to make sure that it, uh, that, uh, their home looks, looks good. Before I move on, is there any question so far on the listing appointment, I mean, listing presentation? Okay. Next, I want them to understand what it means. What does an internet driven housing market mean? It means the buyer, not the realtor, is in the driver's seat. This is very important if you're selling somebody's house who hasn't sold a home in about 15 years because they are still in the mindset of realtor tours and the realtor telling a friend about the house and all of that. So I explained to the um, home homeowner that pre-internet marketing tools such as mailings, newspaper and magazine advertising, flyer boxes, realtor tours, and open houses are statistically insignificant in the marketing of your home. Again, according to the National Association of Realtors. Why am I doing that? Be why am I saying this? Because I'm not doing newspaper, magazine, flyer boxes, realtor tours, and open houses. I am, I am setting the expectation. Don't look at me for this because I'm telling you up front, they don't sell houses, so I don't do them anymore. So what do, what do realtors do? Well, buyers rely on the MLS via the internet to find their home, and then they rely on us to provide access to the MLS, provide entry into the home, advise them on value and marketability, write, print, present, negotiate offers, and handle the transaction to closing. So we're not completely worthless. We have a job, but it is no longer the job of the realtor to physically expose buyers to the home. And that's a very important a key point for your homeowner because they need to understand, to Rima's point, you said, what if the home is a mess? They need to understand that we are not in 1983 where the buyer doesn't know the home is a mess until they walk in the front door. They they will not get to the front door if we don't make sure that home looks good online, that the home, the entry into the home starts online. And so their home must look good. And that becomes your job. Rather than your job being telling everybody about the home, your job becomes making that home look as good as it possibly can and pricing that home right. Then I talk about the sign in the yard. And I talk about, I, I often tell homeowners, this is the only pre-internet marketing that is still very effective. So how are my signs different? I explained to them that our signs have our team number on it. So every call on their home will not be coming in to an anonymous realtor, but will be coming to someone on my team who will answer the call. And if they don't want to make a phone call, they can go to our website where their home will be featured. Um, and you can use your own own website with this um, where their home will be featured and they can uh, the, the buyer can contact us and then and then we're going to lead into price. So if you'll notice the flow of the listing presentation, I have told them about me and our brokerage and our team. I've led the educated them as to marketing staging. I've told them what it takes to market and sell a house. What's our third component? We're now going to price the home. So the next thing I do is I begin to educate them as to pricing. Location, location, location is a lie. Price, price, price is the driver of sales. An overpriced home in a good location won't sell and a well-priced home in a bad location will sell. And I usually give them anecdotes of homes that I've sold uh, that were in horrible locations, but because we priced them right, uh, they sold. So what is a well-priced home? A well-priced home is not what you need to get out of it, what a home in your neighborhood sold for over a year ago, what you paid for it, what you put into it, what you need out of it, or what the builder is charging for it. A well-priced home is what a similar home sold for in the past year. Similar means the same neighborhood, preferably, same square footage, same quality of build, same age with allowances or subtractions made for amenities or defects. 
And then this is a very important slide. So write this down and do some form on your own because this is very important for, for homeowners to understand. In the old days, if you guys remember Ed Nunnemaker, it was in our office. Some, if, if anybody's online that knows, I know Ed's out of the business, but he, he was worked in Gahanna for years. He's older than dirt. But anyway, so Ed used to know Gahanna like the back of his hand. If you sold a home in Gahanna and you wanted to know what it was priced, you called Ed Nunnemaker or PJ O'Connor. One, one of those two knew knew what the home should sell for. How did they know? Because they sold all of them. They walked through all of them. They knew everybody. And so all you had to do to convince a, a buyer to that the price was right was that because PJ or Ed Nunnemaker said that's what it should sell for. Okay, that's the, we're, we're, we don't have that anymore. We don't have that sort of depth, that 20 year depth of knowledge of the interior houses. As much as I love Ed, we have something better. It's called the internet. And this now, so the first sale of any pricing we put on a home is we have to sell to the buyer. Meaning when that buyer walks in the home and we've put that home at 300,000, that buyer first of all has to be the first affirmative stamp on that price saying, yes, this is the best home at 300,000 um, that is out there. Yes, I like it. So that's the first sell, it's the sell to the buyer. Next, we have to sell to the realtor advising the buyer because that realtor is that buyer's advocate. So any of you who've ever represented a buyer know when you stand in the kitchen and that buyer's so excited and they look at you and they say, Jay, what should I offer on this home? At that moment, that buyer would pay less price because they love the home. And so it is the realtor's job to go back, run comparable sale data and say, Mrs. Buyer, I know you love this home, but nothing in this neighborhood has sold within 20,000 of that. And all of a sudden the buyer deflates and says, well, gosh, then I don't want to pay less price for it. So again, the second sell is to that realtor advising the buyer. Now, what we've had in the last eight years is a buyer is willing to overpay for a home and realtor writes the contract because they know the buyer won't get the home unless they overpay for the home. So what is the third gatekeeper? That becomes the appraiser. The appraiser is going to come in and, and the, the appraiser who represents the interest of the, the bank is going to come in and check all of our work. And they're not going to care if the buyer is pregnant or school is starting or the realtor's written five offers. They don't care. Their job is to say, uh, what is this home worth and how will my client, who is the bank, how are, will their interests be protected? So I tell my homeowners, I start down here with the appraiser. I want to know what your home will appraise for. And that's what we aim for. Now, if I price it right for the appraiser, then the realtor is going to be able to sell it and the buyer is going to see that it competes well with everything out there. So again, not to bleed into a pricing class, but your, your seller needs to understand that the days of uh, believing Ed Nunnemaker are gone. Now we have the internet, the buyer has a lot of information, we have detailed data, we have interior photos, we've got to sell to the appraiser and then know that we that what with the number we've come up with is going to be easy for the realtor to digest and the buyer to buy. Make sense? Any questions about that? I next explained to my uh, homeowners about the lockbox on their door. I explained to them how it works. I explained the security of it. I talk about the app on our phone. I show them what their uh, showing request will look like. And I also show them that we have a record of all of the um, uh, showings. At that point, I'm, I want them to tell me about what their comfort level is. Do they have dogs and cats? All that sort of thing. And so we want to look at that and, um, and be able to, them to be comfortable with our lockbox system. And then finally, I ask them, invite them to go read our reviews again, um, check us out, ask any questions they have, and then I thank them. At that point, I have finished the um, presentation part, and what I do at that point is I, I um, uh, bring out the, the pricing of the home, and we go over comparable sales and pricing. That's what we do next. So any questions, anything that I didn't cover?
Sandy, are you there? I am. I just want to say thank you. That was outstanding. Good. Did it? Be, that's nice. But does anyone have a question? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I appreciate it. Very nice. But it, does anybody have anything to ask? Any any problems you've hit with a listing? Anything like that that you say? 